Should I? Is that all right with everybody? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Um, yeah, so essentially the topic today is non-infectious diseases of the upper respiratory tract. And we talked a fair bit about the sort of clinical presentations of upper respiratory diseases with when we were talking about the infectious diseases. So there was a couple of diseases I just thought I'll just make sure that we're covering them sort of thing. So I've got a couple of pickies to guide the discussion. Wish I hadn't just run up and down the stairs. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, does anybody want to describe what they're seeing in, in, in this picture of a dog's nose and eye? Do you want me to give you a signalment while you have a think about it? And, and you can describe it. I can have a go at describing it. Yeah, go for it. Um, so, it looks like there's a unilateral um, nasal uh, crusting or um, buildup of debris. Uh, in the right nasal um, passage and uh, at the nares, yeah. um, I think it's the alar fold. looks looks to be quite crusted. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to comment on the right eye. Maybe there's a little bit of alopecia around it, um, or it could just be the dog, um, mm -hmm. and it's closed. Uh, mm -hmm. The left eye, I think I can see blood vessels. So potentially that's the like the tapetum and the retina. So maybe there's madriasis in that eye or yep. maybe it's just a dark room, I'm not sure. But yep. that's it, the left nostril looks pretty unaffected. Yeah, awesome, good. The left um, nostril is also in shadow, so it's a bit, I think it's a bit hard mm. to tell. Yeah, I agree. I wouldn't be able to say that that's definitely normal, um, but I definitely think that the right nostril is ab it's very abnormal, more abnormal than the left. So um, predominantly right-sided changes. So. This is an 11 year old dog who presents with blepharospasm of the right eye. Um, and on examination has a corneal ulcer and zero tear production on the right side. Does anybody want to take a punt? Yeah, take their discussion any further? I guess I would be, I mean, I know that the nose doesn't um, lack any of the normal architecture. It's not too pigmented and it looks like there's a bit of dried mucoid discharge in the right eye as well. Mm -hmm. I think um, because of the lack of tear production and the unilateral signs of the eye and the nose, I'd be concerned about just a, an idiopathic. Um, uh, I can't remember what the condition is called, but it's idiopathic. <laughs> Sudden onset, lack of tear production, and you get a dry, crusty nose on that side awesome. and a dry, crusty eye. <laughs> yes, it's that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wanted to start right at the front of the dog, and this is the most rostral disease we see, I think. <laughs> um, so um, does anyone know the name of it? It's an idiopathic, um, um, oh. like ne the neurogenic dry eye, that one, yes. yeah, neurogenic dry eye, yeah, yeah, well done. And the actual it's not idiopathic, it's neurogenic, yeah, yes, exactly, yeah. So, what's the actual name of the nasal changes, like zero something, Good. zero stoma, something, or zero, zero stomia, zero mycteria. That one. <laughs> yeah. So it's X E R O M Y C T E R I A. Um, now we have case of this, Josh. What? So we've said it's neurogenic. Can you kind of describe what lesions might cause this? Um, I think. This one was, I do remember this one. I remember diving into the neuroanatomy textbook. And dive with Paul. <laughs> it was really confusing. Um, and I can't remember. <laughs> I don't think, I, I think it was um, like, I'm not sure what causes it. I think it's just um, injury to, I can't remember. Like, I'm thinking like the, the um, I can't remember. No, sorry. No, that's totally fine. I won't push it any further. 
Well, I just know um, we're looking at one area where two nerves. I think we're looking for like facial nerve crossing ooh. over. Um, but there was one area that started with P in your yeah. neuro anatomy. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the facial nerve certainly is involved with tear production, but mm -hmm. you had Bell's palsy. I'd ex <clears throat> you'd expect to see drooping on the face on that side, which I don't see. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. So we don't really have the lip folds to be able to say that it's not present, but certainly this is a disease of the facial nerve um, and specifically of the parasympathetic fibres of the facial nerve. So if we remember the parasympathetic, activation of the parasympathetic system causes watch syndrome. What symptom? Corners. <clears throat> oh, sorry. I mean like body-wide, like if I give really high doses of, um, uh, oh, my gosh, neostigmine or periodistigmine, uh, what are the symptoms? Like slud signs? Elevation, lacrimation, yeah, exactly. urination, duplication. Yeah. Exactly. So when you've got failure of the parasympathetic system, you end up with dryness of the eyes and the tract. Um, so this is focal to the lacrimal duct. So the parasympathetic fibers travel through the facial nerve. So it's take on the same course as the facial nerve. But when they go through the terigo palatine fossa, mm -hmm. that was the P word. <laughs> it starts with a T, actually. It actually starts with a P, but sound wise starts with a T. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the nerve comes through that fossa and then splits off. And most of the motor fibers of the facial nerve come down and serve the rest of the face, but the um, <laughs> parasympathetic fibers come up and go to the lacrimal duct. Um, so the reason why that's so important is because if you see this, it's really important to check for facial motor function because it would suggest that there's a more diffuse facial nerve lesion, which might be, what differentials would there be? Like a more, I guess anywhere along its pathway, um, if it's really small. Um, so it could be kind of like trauma, I think inner ear and middle ear disease maybe as well, um, and probably brain stem, but I think it's probably less likely because you'd see other, more likely other cranial nerves involved. Yeah. Um, so most commonly associated with otitis media, this condition, if you see this. Um, so look down the ear holes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not my <feel. laughs> um, So how, I mean, otitis media is kind of off topic for upper respiratory tract, but definitely nasal diseases are on topic, I feel like. Um, hmm. the, going through these chapters in Edinger, I'm just realising they actually didn't talk about discoid lupus or any of the, like, nasal planum disorders did anybody did i miss that did anybody else see them maybe they come up in the autoimmune chapters but i have to say they did, they did a bit i think yeah. in the autoimmune chapters yeah and we're, we're actually got a lot more autoimmune coming i think um so we'll probably go into a lot more detail then um so uh, yeah i forgot to include that in this but i'm sure we'll get to it um anna can you hear me yeah i can yeah ah that's really weird. My button, if I press mute, uh, it's doing the reverse thing. So oh. I'm talking away before. But anyway, I, I missed the signalment of this dog, but um, could we put hypothyroidism there Absolutely. for a facial nerve paralysis? Yeah. Okay. Um, that's cool. an interesting point, actually. Mm -hmm. So idiopathic mm -hmm. facial nerve paralysis, for sure. Mm -hmm. but if in the absence of facial nerve paralysis, it wouldn't be high on my list, actually. Um. So this is a bit of a trick question because nobody really knows for sure. But do you know what the mechanism of neuropathy with hypothyroidism is? <laughs> no, and you've just done to me what I do to the students. They ask me a question and I answer with the question. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. <laughs> <I'm there. laughs> um, so no, no one really knows um, definitively and it's probably multifactorial, but it's probably to do with cholesterol metabolism changes mm -hmm. and the effect that that has on myelin and then therefore nerve conduction. Okay. Um, 
So in theory, hypercholesterolemia of any cause could potentially lead to idiopathic neuropathies. Okay. Interesting. Um, the, in theory, yeah. Um, so that would then be quite unlikely to just target those parasympathetic fibers. Mm. Whereas if we've got a more diffuse facial palsy, then absolutely very high on this. Okay, cool. Thank you. That's all right. Um, okay, I'm going to put another picky up just for fun. Uh, I'm going to put in the nasal CT. So I've done this a million times, I think. But I always in consult put this up for clients when I'm trying to explain how we need to look into nasal disease um, in their dog because they they always sort of think, oh, why don't you just have a look in there? So this is a CT of dogs' noses at various points. So um, this is probably a German Shepherd or a long-nosed dog. Um, but this is really quite close to the front of the dog's nose. So just behind the kind of alar fold sort of thing, it gets really busy really quickly. Um, and you can see the sort of level of turbinate detail there. Does anybody um, know what the function of this region of the nose is? Like conditioning, isn't it? Um, like air conditioning? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Air conditioning. <laughs> That's very funny. Warming, right? up, like, warming up the air. Yeah. And it like, moistens the air and, and they can use it for like cooling. Yes, exactly. Thermal regulation. Yeah. Oh. So yeah, that's a really good point actually, cooling. Um, so really good evaporative cooling through that part of the nose because there's so much surface area. And the main thing is humidification so that the air that goes down to the lungs is picking up a lot of that moisture on the way through. And it also has a bit of a sort of a dust filter too, doesn't it? Yeah, well, absolutely. If you look at, look at it, it's like the ultimate labyrinth. So the dust or foreign particles are gonna have a lot more trouble getting through there than they would if the dog was mouth breathing. Okay, as we head a little bit further quarterly, so we can still see the septum here. Um, this, this area of the nose, like so goes a little bit further quarter, a little bit further quarter, and these areas have a pretty similar function. So they're predominantly the olfactory parts of the nose. So particularly this dorsal part up here. So this is actually the common nasal cavity. So as the sort of up the back of the nose over the hard palate, but this, um, there's no division between the sides anymore. Um, so once you get back to this part where it's common in, in this ventral part, the dorsal part is the olfactory area. And you can see the as you sort of step a few millimetres back, the olfactory lobe just sits right behind that. So this area is full of nerve fibres that deliver the scent directly to that olfactory lobe. So you can see that where you have a problem in the nose is going to dictate how you're going to be able to approach it for um, biopsies and things. So if we talk about neoplasia a little bit, um, say we've got a six-year-old dog who presents with a three-month history of increased respiratory noise when at rest and a sudden onset epistaxis from the left nostril. Um, so fairly young dog. Um, let's say it's a border collie. If you if it's if you do a CT and you find a mass, what's it most likely to be? What's the most common the nasal neoplasia in a dog? Adenocarcinoma. Yeah, absolutely. And it's usually above the upper fourth carnassial tooth. Yeah, is that right? I didn't realise they had it yep. had a yeah. That's usually where you find them. Yeah, interesting. Um, what other neoplasias do we see in the nose of dogs? Lymphoma. Um, Great. And carcinoma. Uh, well, adenocarcinoma is most the most common. Um, but do you mean not the adeno, just the carcinoma? Yeah, like like just other like um yep. like cell. undifferentiated carcinomas. Yeah. Yeah, good. Excellent. You get chondrosarcoma too, I think, can't you? 
Excellent. So I'm glad you said that because I specifically said border collie and chondrosarcomas of the nose are a border collie thing. Mm. So they like to get them. Um, does anyone know what you'd see on a CT with a chondrosarcoma? No, I've never seen one. All mine have been abnos, but um, I thought he was a little bit young for um, for an adenocarcinoma, actually. So I reckon there was something else. Yeah. <laughs> this is not a real case, Jeff. I'm just making it up. <laughs> I, I guess you would. Sorry. I guess you would get thickening of the cartilage and bone in that area, sort of the. Yeah. Um, yeah, usually arising from one of the mm. um, uh, tissues. What are they called? <laughs> structural, <laughs> not structural. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. I'm just <laughs> struggling to go, you know, the, the kind of um, the foundation, yeah. the, scaffolding, the scaffolding of the nasal. Yes, the building, <laughs> the building blocks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, stromal tissues, is that right? Not really. Anyway, um, it's a, they're really interesting on CT and radiographs actually because the cartilage, so chondrosarcoma, it's a cartilage tumour, the cartilage proliferates, but some of it ossifies and actually radiographically or on CT looks like a, they call it a popped popcorn. Like it looks like it's mm -hmm. kind of just gone like that and oh. you get these like fluffy bony sort of changes, um, but quite distinctive. Um, so we see our tumour that is isolated to the left side of the nose and does not appear to be involving the brain. What are we going to do next? It's here. Oh, um, tell the owners not to buy a big bag of dog food. <laughs> <laughs> Should we buy up it, Jeff? <laughs> That's that's a very good idea before you tell them, yes. Is that a quite yeah. a difficult area to biopsy though, I imagine? Uh, you might get a blind biopsy, maybe. Absolutely, yeah. So border collie, we'd probably be able to get the rigid scope up there. So you, you can this stuff is quite is a, a little bit flexible. You can squeeze things through there. Um, but through the size of the scope that you'd be able to squeeze to that area, the chances of actually being able to get meaningful biopsy sizes mm. is pretty slim. So you cause a lot of trauma on the way in, but you may not get the benefit. Yeah. One thing I was worried about is it looks like it's above the, like just above like the Kuwani like part, like the right at the back. So yeah. I was just wondering like, that's pretty, pretty far back. <laughs> Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Um, so one way that you could do that safely is potentially with CT guidance. So put the faucets in, yep, and then go, zoop, yep, still not there, still not there, still not there, and just move like a millimetre at a time. Oh, cool. Yeah, so we've done a couple of nasal biopsies like that with Mariano in the clinic, and that's just been really reassuring because normally what I do with my blind bi biopsies is just measure the depth to the um medial campus and then just don't go past that but this is actually like this is the orbit here i think so mm -hmm. this is this is getting mm -hmm. to the levels of the eyes that i wouldn't be that comfortable about seeing um so we're thinking those want to add no is the most likely thing just based on the it happens commonly what does anyone know what we quite often see on biopsies where we're suspicious of nasal adenocarcinoma? Yeah. What would you expect? Lymphoplasmacytic uh, inflammation. Excellent. What you commonly see on anything in the nose. Yep. So it's one of the most frustrating things is you get these centimetre wide biopsies and the dog bleeds for eight hours and then the pathologist comes back and says inflammatory tissue. The carcinomas cause a huge amount of inflammation around the tumour. So you've got to get several biopsies at several levels to make sure that you've got the tissue while you're in there. Um, every now and again, so what, um, so I'm just going to tell you, but every now and again, the tumours go through the nasal bones 
And that's sometimes a much less invasive way of getting a biopsy. So if you've seen that there's um, a disruption to that bone, going down through that hole is going to be less invasive than going nasally. And you're going to get less bleeding because you're kind of coring the tumour and it's still kind of contained in itself rather than have it just like essentially just pulling it out the nose. Um, so sometimes we get the surgeons involved if that defect is big enough and sometimes we do FNAs if that's all we can get through there. Um, and sometimes people do sort of true cuts and things like that just to get a slightly bigger sample. But again, I'd want to do that under CT guidance um, in this circumstance. Weren't there some reports of successful uh, harvesting of um, neoplastic tissue using nasal flush? I think mm. they put a, a swab in the pharynx and uh, catch it in there. Yeah, so that's a really good point. So if I was seeing a tumour here, or further rostral, then that's certainly a possibility. So, do you do you want me to look get a, a lateral view of the nose so that, or is this sort of comprehensible? So the nose is sort of all one bit, all one bit, and then it splits almost into the dorsal and ventral parts, and the ventral part flows into the pharynx. But this dorsal part where we're sort of saying this tumour is, if we flush with force, we're just going to push it back up against the cribriform plate and the brain. Mm. Does that make sense? Right. I didn't know that before, but it split dorsally like that. Yeah, it's really interesting. Why don't I look up a lateral image, which I think I closed right before I opened Zoom, which is annoying. This is my highly scientific way of researching for Google. Um, sure, sure. Okay, this is probably going to be the best one. Okay. Um, so if we look at this, so nasal planar, and then as we move back from sort of dorsal to ventral, the nasal cavity is all one, back to about halfway along the hard palate when it splits off and we get nasal cavity and then nasopharynx. But this whole dorsal part, this olfactory part of the nose is like a blind-ended kind of cave. So anything that any tumours or neoplasia or infection, like particularly aspergillosis, which loves to sit up here, you flush and flush and flush, and the fluid's just going zoom, zoom, zoom. It's not actually getting up into this spot. Um, so aspergillosis, that's still beneficial because you do create a bit of turbulence and, and it's kind of got a debriding effect. But for a tumour, you're really unlikely to create enough force in this area to actually dislodge a bit of tissue. Um, I still I still do it, but I'm more wary of neoplasia in this spot just because of the proximity to the brain. So I don't like to use too much force, particularly if I haven't done a CT. So Anna, can I ask, when we pass retroflect a, a scope around the soft palate and go to the caudal kuani, where... Oh, sorry. Can on you your get... picture. <laughs> yeah. Where are, are we still going into, we retroflect around the soft palate, we're still going into the nasopharynx and that ventral area, right? Yeah, exactly. So, okay. So we're mm. actually, what we see of the nose on a scope is pretty limited. Mm. Um, so the biggest, in the biggest dog, so we've got a couple of kind of 25 kilo plus dogs who we've been able to get right up into the frontal sinuses to debride for with aspergillosis, so avoiding mm -hmm. that trephination of the sinus. But they've got such big dogs with really sickly destructive rhin rhinitis, so they've got less of that turbinate tissue in there, which means we've got more room to move mm -hmm. to actually get a good look at this area. Okay. Um, but, yeah, we go straight in. We usually go ventral because it's the biggest. Mm -hmm. And then we end up in the caudal nasal cavity. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah, there's a whole heap we don't really assess very well. I just get lost. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And actually, I've 
I kind of follow a bit of a map when I do my rhinoscopy and I, I, I went to New York and did a two-day workshop with the leaders in rhinoscopy and I still get lost even with my mental map and extra training and like it's yeah, wow. just the most confusing and breed dependent um, yes. area of the body. I think rhinoscopy has like huge role, but not as part of the investigation as part of the tool to mm. either therapy or biopsy or something like that. It's not, mm. not very helpful to <laughs> just look around. Mm. It's essential to do a, um, a study of the caudal nares because you do get, you do get lumps and bumps in there. Absolutely. So this, I mean, this is quite a small space. So if you've got a one centimetre or two centimetre tumour in most dogs, it'll be bulging through there. You'll see it. Mm -hmm. So, big about it too. I was going to say, the, the other thing I've noticed is <clears throat> it's very hard to distinguish the, the tumour tissue from normal nasal tissue. Um, oh. I've Absolutely. seen yeah. I've seen some that I've been able to pick, but most of the time you can't. And uh, you, you pick the most the most obvious spot and biopsy that, and from then on it's bleeding like a stuck pig, and you've got a blind biopsy the rest. Exactly. Yeah. So that's it. As soon as you biopsy, you lose your visualization. So you want to be bloody sure that you're biopsying the right thing. <laughs> bloody sure is correct. <laughs> um, I got a funny story that <laughs> um, it's a little bit embarrassing. So my, my parents are not medical or veterinary and they don't really understand my qualification or what I do. And they got a stray dog, like picked up a rescue dog that had been diagnosed with a nasal mass at the vet that kind of rehomed it. And it was just a kind of, it's only got a year to live. It's got a nasal mass. It's got chronic nasal discharge. Two years down the track, they said to me, oh, it's not really dying. Um, so can you look into it? Anyway, the dog had lymphocytic plasmacytic rhinitis, but the vet had just done the rhinoscopy without the CT and they'd seen obviously one of the bulges and gone, oh, there's definitely a mass in there. So then my parents are stuck with this dog <laughs> <laughs> with lymphocytic plasmacytic rhinitis, which is a nightmare. Sneezing all over the place for yes, not years to come. Everywhere for years to come, exactly right. <laughs> but then they didn't like my diagnosis, so they took the dog to another vet who I'd trained, who was my intern. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. For a second opinion, she calls and she comes out of the console room and she's like, Anna, I don't know what to do, your parents are <laughs> That's hilarious. That so funny. She agreed with me. <laughs> <laughs> they point to a lot, don't they? Oh, my. I think I'll always be 10 in their mind. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. Um, all right. Is there, Anna, can you tell um, or everybody where your most common, looking at the CT, like the 3D mm. view, most common location for foreign bodies is in a dog? Oh, such a good point. Is it ventrally, caudally, uh, rostrally? Really, 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 really rostral. Right, um, okay. Or actually in this bit. Right. So oh, um, scoping is quite not a bad thing for a foreign body. Um, it depends, or flushing. It depends how big it is. So what right. I, this, my experience with nasal foreign body. So I had a dog with a Kelpie with a seven centimeter long stick and the dog had run into a patch of bamboo, come out with a bleeding nose, yelping and pouring at its nose. Like it was very clearly a foreign body and I couldn't find it. Like I was like, oh, we don't need to CT. It'll be fine. I'll be able to find it. And I could not oh, find wow. it. Wow. Yeah. Um, and we went to CT and then then we're able to say, okay, there it is. But because it goes in that way, all you're seeing is like a half a millimetre wide stick potentially. And because there's blood in there and like it's actually it's not that easy. I had one pug that had a rock in its nose. That was easy. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> it's been there for months as well, which is the best part. Um, yeah, with the grass seeds, like the, the barley grass seeds you see in the Riverina and Canberra and so on, um, they're hard to visualise because they're usually surrounded by pus. Yes, mm. yeah. There's always nasal discharge. That's why they come in. It's so yeah. hard. Mm. And what I find difficult without the CT, if we're sort of suspicious of a nasal foreign body, that history is really clear, 
if that foreign body is dorsal and you can't see it, so you decide to flush, there's a really good chance you're going to flush it up into here, mm. which is that black hole. Yeah. Yeah, right. That's actually really hard to get anything out of once it goes into there. So, with, I mean, I, all try, I try really hard to talk people into CTs for nasal disease because yep. it just helps guide everything. Mm. And I did a um, I had a real interesting case a couple of months ago. It was a old um, miniature poodle, very old. I was pretty sure it was going to be a cancer up the nose, mm. but um, we did, and they didn't they didn't want to do CT. So we did dental radiographs and radiographs, and he had this huge lytic lesion around the palatal root of the one of the upper carnassials. Oh, right. And it was so big and there was just a soft tissue sort of density in that side of the nose and the sinuses. And when I took out the tooth and I flushed up there, all this pus came out the nose. I was certain we'd got it and it just, yeah. you know, he was better. After a week, though, every, all the snottiness, all the unilateral signs came back. You know, another flush, I thought it's just still this dental lesion. Mm. And then and then like a month later, another flush. And the, um, another vet did a flush and a blind biopsy and it was an adenocarcinoma. Oh. <laughs> so it's like we I was just sure I was like, you know, I was like, right, I've never seen dental lesion cause this, but it was this huge lytic lesion. But maybe the lysis was caused by the adenocarcinoma jet because it was in that location. Yeah. Above that carnassial. And carcinomas are tumors that can develop with chronic inflammation. So, right, yeah, right. It's a bit mm. of a stretch to have a dental infection for long enough <laughs> causing a plasia, but yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> inflammation. I thought, oh, we yeah. the owners that the owners felt vindicated. They said no to the CT, but then after a couple of months, they like wish they'd done the CT to <laughs> start. Yeah. I'm so often in that situation. We should have done the CT. <laughs> really important to do your imaging before you start fiddling around in the nose too yeah absolutely what do we think of nasal radiographs waste of time and money that's i'm spoiled yeah. but that's my opinion as well yeah. yeah i got some beautiful images but they weren't helpful in diagnosing the adenocarcinoma really <laughs> nice images yeah. but still was not helpful textbook <laughs> images <laughs> useless beautiful they're just so insensitive like the, you see soft tissue density and you're like yep soft tissue density could be snot could be tumor don't know um now i'm going i do have to wrap up a little bit early today just because i've got a conference starting at nine and i need to get a cup of coffee before that starts <laughs> <laughs> so uh, i'll just keep an eye on the time um so i'll finish up at 10 2 the things i wanted to cover just the things that we see most commonly so we've talked about most common tumor in dogs is adenocarcinoma and getting really um, aggressive biopsies which we make josh do because medicine people don't like to make things bleed uh, <laughs> and then cats uh, what's the most common nasal tumor in a cat lymphoma good yeah absolutely so that's the most common malignant tumor what non-malignant tumors do we see in cats and dogs Oh, fungal. Um, I'm just trying Frenulomas. to see. Mm, good. Yep. Uh, and the other one? Like nasopharyngeal polyps. Great. Excellent. So they're two things that will show up like a mass and you won't know that it's not um, lymphoma until you biopsy it. Fortunately, particularly nasopharyngeal polyps, where are they going to be on our dog? In the nasopharynx. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that was a trick question. <laughs> right. They're usually back here. So if you see a tumor back here, you can start getting a little bit hopeful. Um, whereas crypto in a cat, obviously cats shorter noses, um, but crypto tends to be more up in this dorsal area. So we've actually had a case of crypto at North Shore um, that we sent to MRI because it was it presented with no nasal signs and presented with intracranial signs that had started seizuring and had dullness. Sent it to MRI and it had a brain tumour with some lysis of the this bone overlying the brain. Cribriform plate or uh, cribriform plate is a little bit further down actually. It's down. It's this part. Okay. Um, 
That's the frontal bone, I think. Um, so I had some lysis there, but no nasal disease at all. And this is one of those wish we'd, you know, you see intracranial signs of cat, you do your LCAT, you do your um, toxonia, like toxoplasma, titers, like in routine workup, we didn't do the LCAT. Um, and we took this cat to surgery for its brain tumour and removed its whopping fungal granuloma from its brain, which I would argue improved its recovery and it did quite well. But it was quite a wake-up call. It had an MRI, really detailed imaging. The MRI technician had called it a meningioma. And we had that kind of lysis of the bone, which should have been a giveaway, but apparently sometimes happens with meningiomas, um, according to the radiologist. So it was one of those kind of always check, always check. Having said that, a fungal granuloma of that size in the cranium has got a pretty poor prognosis and surgical debulking is probably best. Like, you know, we may not have counselled for it, but it was probably the best thing for the cat. The cat did quite well. So um, luckily, always do the L cat. Mm. So for any cat with um, neurological signs, seizures, anything you do, yeah. anytime you consider a um, brain imaging, you're going to run an L cat first. Yeah. Particularly given it's a pretty quick turnaround yeah. time, unless they yeah. are in status or something that requires more urgent kind of jumping to conclusions. Um, but if they're having seizures that you can control medically, then yeah, 24 hour turnaround time. I just organize the image, yeah. organize it for two days' time kind of thing. Yeah, cool. <coughs> I thought we saw a disproportionate number of those fungal granulomas in uh, cats and uh, in Adelaide. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, crypto. Yeah. Yes. Like published clusters in the upper end of the Northern Beaches um, and uh, Perth, but I haven't, and then different types of crypto in Perth and East Coast, uh, but I haven't heard Adelaide. No, it, it was just a, a, like a, an observation. Of this. We had quite a number of cases when I was there. I was there for a year and a half. Well, this is why I love these discussions because you you don't know like that that's there's probably a cluster in Adelaide. It's just that it's never been published, mm -hmm. so you never know unless you're talking to people with stuff like mm -hmm. that. I, I wouldn't say necessarily it was Adelaide City. I I, I sort of I, I actually don't remember where they came from, but um, precisely. But uh, along the Murray, I was wondering. Mm -hmm. mm. uh, the River Redgum. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, obviously, we were situated in Adelaide and we got referrals from all over. Mm. Uh, and, uh, yeah, look, I can't remember well enough where they actually came from, but I sort of vaguely think it might have been the north to the north, but but um, no, don't rely on that. Mm. So I remember making the observation, do you seem to see a lot of those? Yeah. Or you <laughs> see things in runs, don't you? It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, I lost a bottle of red wine recently uh, with a cat was presented with a stirter, um, retroflex around the soft palate, nice creamy mass right at the coani. And I went, hello, there's the lymphoma I was looking for. Yeah. Uh, classic case, biopsied it, and it was a crypto granuloma. Really? Like, yeah. Yes. So I lost that bottle of red wine. Yeah. Was okay. like, <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <Yeah. laughs> They're the most rewarding ones, though. Like when I scope something and I look up the back here and I can see this like bloop, 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 in there, I love flushing those ones because they're mm. so productive. It just flushes like you generate so much pressure Get through there. Chunk, it don't you? Yeah. 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 It's so Lovely. <laughs> um, same thing with polyps, actually. I've actually removed polyps with flushing when they're kind of in that because you can generate so much kind of pressure and force um, and just pop it out the back. And sometimes I get my thumb mm. on the edge of the hard palate and massage the soft palate. Oh, and yeah. sometimes they come, you get a chunk of tissue. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Mm. Um, so what other causes? We've sort of covered infectious, we've covered neoplastic, causes of um, nasopharyngeal disease. Let's kind of move back specifically into this region. So say we've got a cat who's a chronic snuffler 
and all of a sudden is mouth breathing and having trouble actually moving air through their nose. Is there any disease that you'd be suspicious of with progression of sort of nasal signs? Mm. So a chronic snuffler with a history of like Khaleesi or herpes and then um, um, I'm not quite... Could be either. I'm, what I'm fishing for is um, stenosis. Ah, okay. So any animal that's had an inflammatory episode back here is potentially um, susceptible to stenosis of this region. Um, it can be actually quite spectacular. So dogs in particular can, when they've um, regurgitated and they've had acid go up the back of their nose, most common cause in dogs, whereas um, viral rhinitis is most common in cats. Um, they can actually close their nasopharynx completely. So it's just scars completely closed. Wow. Yeah. Um, so particularly when you're sort of asking the history when you've got onset of nasal discharge, asking for a history, looking for episodes of inflammation sort of a couple of months before potentially is something that that, that would put that on my radar. Um, and you've got to use quite thin slices on a CT to pick it up because it can be quite a thin membrane. Um, so if you miss that in your slice, you won't actually see it. But it would, like looking at this here, you just have a line of tissue like this mm. across there. So a history of regurgitation or vomiting in the, in is that what you're looking box. for? Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's the most common cause. And can you boutonage them somehow? Yes, it's so cool. <laughs> yeah, so we put the scope up here. We put a guide wire through there and we watch it come through if you've got a hole, but when you don't have a hole, you have to put a catheter, poke it through pull the needle out, put the guide wire through the catheter, pull the catheter out, put your balloon over the wire mm -hmm. through the hole that you've made. So you kind of bougie it just with the balloon and then you inflate the balloon. It's really fun. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Does it reform likely to? Or yeah. Is... So actually, I always think cats are more are harder with stuff like this, but cats are likely to resolve with a first balloon whereas dogs almost always recur and they've invented these new stents that you can put in there to hold them open oh wow yeah and then you can go into so you hold them open for um like six weeks or something like that and then you go in and you grab one end of the stent and it unravels and you just pull it out the nose oh so cool <laughs> crusty yeah, <laughs> it would be so gross, wouldn't it? There'd be so much stuff on it. Um, anyway, so that's a really uncommon thing that I said we'd just talk about common things. Um, tell me, what, are, what is the most common clinical sign for disease localised to the cord or nasal pharynx in a dog? A stertor. Good, yep. <laughs> One more. A reverse. reverse sneezing. Good, excellent. So that's what I wanted to get out of you. So caudal nasal cavity disease causes reverse sneezing. Cranial nasal, rostral nasal cavity disease causes sneezing proper. It's rare that it's like one or the other. They've usually got both. But I usually quiz owners on what's more common. Um, excellent. So let's talk about laryngeal paralysis. What breed is most commonly affected by laryngeal paralysis? Labbies, Labradors, good golden retrievers. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Um, other like breeds that we don't see very often here, but St. Bernard's, Newfoundland's, Irish Setters, and Brittany Spaniels, apparently, but we, we just don't see very many of them. Newfies, definitely. Sorry, visitors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, what's What's the most common cause of laryngeal paralysis? I think polyneuropathy. Absolutely. Yeah. So a generalised polyneuropathy. Any other? Yeah. Hypothyroidism. Yep. Excellent. Which causes polyneuropathy? Trauma. 
from pulling on the neck suddenly, like the dog on the U back of the U. Um, yes, absolutely. In the country, that happens. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, so what's the most common pres presentation for laryngeal paralysis? Mm, a geriatric dog. Yeah. Yes. Good. And yeah. what's their clinical signs? A strider and yep. kind of, um, they can have to be quite, like if they can be, become like hypothermic quite easily. Yeah. So it can come in kind of collapse and hypothermic. Good, yeah, so that's the most common sort of emergent presentation. Um, what about um, kind of more long-term signs? Uh, I find most commonly, yeah, just loud panting, yep. change in panting, stertorous, stertorous panting, oh. and a little bit of maybe some weakness climbing stairs. Yeah. Yeah, good one. That's, that's a really good thing to screen for is the signs of more generalised neuropathy. What else? Inspiratory dyspnea it is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what would the owners notice when the dog drank? Like coughing? Spluttering. Yeah, absolutely. So do you remember when we talked about cough? differentiating between the expectorating reflex and the cough? What, yes. Which would you expect in this? Expectorating. Good, exactly. So the expectorating is if you sort of visualise something catching on your larynx, you just go <coughs> as a reflex, whereas a, cough, a true cough where you're trying to clear something from the lower airways, you take a deep breath in before you cough. So laryngeal disease cause, ex, causes an expectorating reflex which is still a cough, but it's a very different history. So sort of getting detail from the owner of whether it's a coughing fit or it's just a clearing of the throat sort of thing. And when it happens, so particularly, when would you expect the cough to be present in a dog with laryngeal paralysis? When they've aspirated or have, yeah, probably then. Yep. So eating and drinking. Yes, mm. immediately after eating or drinking. Um, and the, what are you about, saying the cough or the expectorating reflex occurs then? At the expectorating either. reflex, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anytime something tickles the larynx and just goes yeah. too far, yeah, it, it'll happen. And, and is that what we would call clearing the throat? Yes. That expectorating reflex? Yeah. 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 Um, there's and one more clinical sign related to... Um, voice change. Oh, it's yeah, dysphonia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is there a genetic component to these, Anna? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, there's several breeds that have a genetic polyneuropathy, generalised polyneuropathy. I don't know if there's any that have a focal neuropathy that are genetic. Like most of them progress to a more generalised. It starts with laryngeal paralysis and then they develop more generalised within a year, which is one of the big contraindications for surgery. Obviously, if there's a generalised polyneuropathy, putting them through a tie back would be the wrong thing. So we definitely want to screen for that quite closely. Um, there are a couple of congenital ones, forms of um, laryngeal paralysis. Um, we, we didn't talk, we talked about polyneuropathies. What other trauma we talked about? Uh, There's a couple of others I want yeah. to cover. Hello? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, if we go through our damn it V, uh, is there a degenerative? Is that the idiopathic geriatric one? Is that a degenerative disease or does it come under eye for idiopathic? I think it's degenerative. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Uh, congenital, we've talked about. Mm -hmm. Metabolic, we talked about hypothyroidism. Good. Excellent. Neoplasia has to be there. Somewhere. Good. Where? Somewhere along that nerve pathway. Good. Where's the nerve pathway? Sorry. It's a funky one. It is. Um, down to the thorax. Down into the thorax. Uh, yeah, because you get the recurrent laryngeal. Good. 
Ja. Um, oopsies. <laughs> this is not the one I went, meant to get up, but um, this is a dog who presented with change of voice and laryngeal paralysis. Wow. Mm. Wow. Um, so huge heart-based mass, which was obviously mm -hmm. impacting the recurrent laryngeal nerve on its course, intrathoracic component of its course. Um, Alex saw this case with me, actually, I think. Was that? Yeah. I, I did. I thought so. I was like, oh, I remember this dog. Yeah. <laughs> and they purely just only noticed a change in voice. That's it. Exactly. That's what she came in for. Um, so that's her radiograph. Um, so she presented with a change of voice. They did really great radiographs of her throat and then thought, oh, I'll just check her chest very thorough at the vet clinic and notice this dorsal deviation of her trachea. Um, but where else along that pathway do we commonly see um, neoplasia? What about a thyroid pathway or something? Yeah. Absolutely. So always palpate along the neck really thoroughly. Um, and see, so because the pal a thyroid mass can be really dorsal. So get up sort of right behind the trachea if you can um, to feel if there's anything in there. Um, and then local laryngeal neoplasia as well. So in, in a dog, what would be the most common neoplasia we see in that area? Mm. Melanoma. Sorry, say again. Melanoma. Oh, good one, actually. Ooh. Yeah, that would be a really good differential. The squamous cell. Yep. Uh, something of chondro because it's a cartilage. Mm -hmm. Cartilage. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Organ. For sure. Mm. Um, I think the most common one we see is actually um, carcinomas arising from adenocarcinomas arising from salivary glands or the glands in that area and actually invading into the larynx, into laryngeal okay. tissue. Um, but that's the other ones are all very realistic possibilities. So you definitely need to get biopsy samples to um, determine what the treatment would be. What about in a cat? Lymphoma. Lymphoma. Yep. <laughs> awesome. Good, guys. All right, I'm going to run away and make a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, so much, thanks for coming. All right, thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.